let me tell you a little story now. <laughs> I got this job and I want some money. But my boss doesn't know how to count, honey. No, I swear. I only got 25 cents on my last paycheck. I said, oh, no, no, no. I should've got about $200. You know what I'm talking about, baby. And let me tell you something else. He doesn't know how to tell time. And we work from 8 o'clock in the morning till about 9 o'clock the next day. Oh, yeah. He's got a I want a paycheck. I want $200. Oh, baby, baby. Tell Peter he's on in 15 seconds. Well, simple, yet satisfying. What are you doing? Just staring at Come on, guys. No more spit wax on the set. Baby! At the ready on the key. All right, here we go. Quiet on the set. Get the music. Quiet in the door. It's showtime. Let's get ready to jam, man. Let's get ready to jam. Yes, yes, here we are for another week of the jam. Up this time, we have the world of numbers and mathematics. We're gonna go to the first video game design university, plus we'll have some other things later on in the show. I remember I hated math class when I was in school as a young kid, you know? I mean, it was like the numbers, the tables, the homework. I mean, I was like, what's the point? But the fact is, there is an element of mathematics in everything you do, everything that you see. Hello, you primordial bags of sludge, you too. Oh, yes, he's Larry, the omnipotent head in a jar. Ba -da -da. <sighs> yes, it is I, the self-absorbed and all-knowing one. It is Larry, the omnipotent head in a jar. Kung kung. <laughs> Perhaps a brief background of today's subject would be helpful. Mathematics first arose from the practical need to measure time and to count. Thus, the history of mathematics begins with the origins of numbers and recognition of the dimensions and properties of space and cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo time. The earliest evidence of primitive forms of counting occurs in notched bones and scored pieces of wood and stone brought about by the earliest incarnation of Martha Stewart. You know Pythagoras, Sir Isaac Newton, Leonardo da Vinci, not the Titanic guy, Galileo, Einstein. I had all of those ideas a long time ago, but do I ever get credit for it? No, because I'm just a head in a jar. What was that? What are you doing just staring at that TV screen? Don't you know that we're trying to do a show here? Ah! I bet the last time you played a computer game, you didn't think about how much work goes in behind the scenes to make it. Well, now there's a university that teaches you how to program video games. It's called DigiPen, and it's in Redmond, Washington. What makes DigiPen a unique university? Well, I think what makes it unique is the fact that, you know, the students really spend a, a lot of time focusing on the fundamentals. It's not an easy course. It's, a, it's not something where you can, um, it's, it's not a quick type of program. You really have to learn the fundamentals, and, and it's, I think that's really, really important here. When somebody turns on the game box, people have no idea about how much mathematics uh, goes behind the scenes in order to make the game function mostly the graphics, the animation, the motion. So they're actually doing it in a three-dimensional world. And that three-dimensional world is a complete mathematical uh, world that we have computed and we have actually stored in the memory of the machine. 3D programming is quite a lot of math, does it not? Uh, definitely. 
as an artist, it's it's something that uh, we we also take for granted to some degree. I mean, we, we do appreciate what the programmers have to do, but when I create a character using uh, commercial software, uh, I'm not using extensive math. What I need to use are, are sort of more creative skills. I need to be able to understand proportion and color and character design. For the game programmer, though, to actually take my character and make it move in real time uh, the way the player wants, there's a tremendous amount of math, and, and certainly it, it's not something that uh, should be taken lightly. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Saw playing has been going on for over 200 years. And there's a lot of math in saw playing. And it's a combination of compression and tension that creates that sound wave. And it's actually a pure sine wave. So you can actually see the sound wave itself. I'll pour a little sand on the blade. And you can actually see the sound wave develop in a very interesting way. Watch the blade itself. Now it's throwing off the sand, and it's creating perfect parallel lines here, which means it's just a simple sound wave. Here's an A440 wrench, which just means that it has 440 frequencies per second. So you can not only tune your car, but you can tune the National Symphony Orchestra with this wrench. And then I have a tone bar that's twice as high which would be 880 cycles or frequencies per second, which of course is fascinating in mathematics. To make music, you've got to understand all of these frequencies and build your instruments and your music in relationship to them. And then there's that 880 cycles per second, and you see it just, it makes it half the size of the wave. This is natural mathematics. And this exact pattern flows right out as a sound wave and it goes right into your ear. Crucial. The jar is strictly for Larry's head, and that is all. One, two, three, four. So tell me about this ride. Uh, Mr. Freeze is a brand new uh, linear induction motor roller coaster here at Six Flags St. Louis. And it's one of the tallest and fastest in Missouri. What we do is you take a train in the station here using linear induction motors, and we launch a train from zero to 70 miles per hour in uh, about four seconds. We go through a track that's 1,382 feet in length. The train goes through that, comes to a boost tower at the end. At that point, you're only halfway through the ride. And these motors push the train an additional 50 feet in the air to a height of 226 feet. So from that point, the train then falls and comes back through the entire track length in reverse. Linear induction is the uh, same as a uh, rotational motor, but now we've taken, cut it, and laid it out flat. And we put a motor on top of each other. And fins on the side of the cars over here, they uh, pass between these motors, and it creates a magnetic wave that accelerates the train. And you get this exciting, exhilarating, heart-stopping launch. And there it goes. <laughs> the math also play a part in this design, or was that just something that you guys thought looked cool? Well, it did start off as something that looked neat and cool, as yeah. you say. Everybody gives the analogy that we took a paper clip and bent it into a shape. But from that point, then math needs to be applied in order to figure out the forces and the speeds that are required and necessary to, to give you a safe and an exciting, thrilling ride. Three billion, four million, one hundred seventy-three thousand and five. And here he is with a brain teaser and the hair to prove it. It's time to ask the gravity. Welcome back to Ed Adventures and Educational Stuff with me. I'm Und Dr. Andy Und Gravity from some uh, country very far away, which I'm keeping a big secret because it's a party later on. And today we're talking about mathematicalness and all that kind of stuff and how it applies to your regular life. It's kind of fun because you think you can escape it, but you can't. 
So what we got here today is we got a really ordinary goldfish in the ordinary bowl from the ordinary goldfish bowl plates. We call it the pet shop. Hello, fishies. How are we doing, the fishies? I think they're catatonic. Okay, we got the mathematical question ready for you now. The mathematical question is, if you got 200 fish in this fish tank, of which, of course, I know you only got three, but you got to use your imagination just a little bit, people. Can you do that for me? Oh, you're such good friends to use your imagination. You got 200 fish in the bowl, and 99% of those little fishies are guppies. Now, how many of the guppies do you have to take out of the bowl in order to make sure that 98% of the fishes in the bowl are guppies? You got the answer? Well, tell me. Hmm? No, chill. <laughs> Calling Scully. Come in, Scully. That's right, I'm back. Because there's more conspiracies that you're not aware of, even in the area of mm, Matt, yes, the greatest conspiracy of all is something they like to call cryptography. What is cryptography? Does it have anything to do with the ancient ruins of Egypt? Does it have anything to do with my chiropractor? Yes, no, cryptography is the breaking of secret codes, yes. What does that have to do with math? Follow me and come quickly. If you take a small number, like 15, and you break it down into its multiplicated numerals, well, it's quite simple. But not every number is that simple. Take a number of millions and millions of digits. We're talking length, the size of your great Aunt Bertha's girth, you know, the one with the beard. That's the kind of number that if you break it down into its two separate multipliers, you break the code and therefore have a secret that even the greatest computer would take millions and hundreds and dozens and maybe one year to accomplish. Those kind of codes are the things they break for codes for the CIA, the FBI, the ABC, all that. That's all part of it. It's a little weird. You just don't know the truth because it's something, my little buddy, you can't handle. Is my double latte here yet? So what current program are you working on now? Each of us is making our own game engine, um, which is not actually specifically a game um, in and of itself, but it's sort of the structure for a game. And once you've made your game engine, it's like um, a skeleton for your game. There's no specifics to it. I mean, you haven't thought of a specific game that you want to make with rules and graphics and things like that. But what you're doing is you're writing all of the routines so that you can take this game engine when it's done and you can make several different games very quickly. So what are your plans when you graduate? Well, I'd like to make great games for a, for a good company. I mean, that's why I got into this is, uh, and I think that's why most of the students are here, is that they have a love for math and science and, and games in general. Um, all of us play the games, not just work on them and make them. Uh, we play in between classes, we play after school, and, and, uh, and we play at home. It's, it's going to be the dream job. It's like, what, what do I love to do and how can I get paid to do it? And I love to play games, and I'm out to prove my mom wrong that I can get paid mm -hmm. to do it. And uh, a little bit sharp. <laughs> Mort calling Orson. Come in, Mort calling Orson. The love of Pete. Would you? Yes. We're back. Hello, world! It is I, and I am here to declare the truth of the conspiracy! And I know the secrets, all the secrets, right here in the middle of your neighborhood! Why? Because they're taking a census, and it has nothing to do with the computerized chips in the base of your skull. It has everything to do with your address! That's right! Years from now, every 10 years, the government takes a census where they combine your address and your age and through that make a code where they know everything about you. Send it off to some abandoned green silo in Iowa, which stands for idiots out wandering around, where these people take the number. We interrupt this transmission to apologize for the comments of the previous character. We like Iowa. People from Iowa are very nice. And they raise corn and many, many other fine things. This person is an idiot. Thank you. It's my life mission to juggle where no man has juggled before. You might wonder what mathematics has to do 
with juggling. Well, mathematics has often been described as the science of patterns, where juggling, you could think of as controlling patterns in time and space. Well, how do you connect math with juggling? Well, imagine that time goes by in discrete little dots here, and if I put a three, that means I take the ball and I throw it and it comes down three time units later. This is time moving that way. So if I put another three and another three, suppose we put threes under all these little time dots like this. Then this ball should come down three time units later, three clicks, and three later. Now if we put all these threes together, it looks like this. This is the basic three ball cascade, which is the foundation of all the juggling tricks. The big new discovery made just a few years ago by jugglers and mathematicians. You have your dots here, but now you can put different numbers underneath them. You can put something like a three, a four, a five, a three, a four, a five. And what does that mean? This ball comes down three ticks later, this one four later, this one five later, and you keep it up. Three, four, five. So you might say, what patterns can you juggle and what patterns can't you? For example, could you do three, five, four? Three, five, four, three, five, four, and so forth. If you tried to actually do that, draw the picture, three goes there, the five goes one, two, three, four, five here, and the four goes, uh-oh, goes there. A big collision. You hate that in juggling. Ah, bad for a uh, gust, sudden gust of gravity, we'll do it again. That's five. Hmm. Well, that was pretty cool. Come on, guys, no more spit wads on the set. Engineer extraordinaire on this rainy day in Gotham City talking about Batman the Ride. Similar to most roller coasters, Batman takes you up a lift hill. That's the tall hill that takes you up to a height of 105 feet. Uh -huh. uh, when you come off that hill, then you enter a series of a loop, a corkscrew, and then a second loop. But each of those elements is successively smaller. The lift starts at 105 feet. The first loop is at 77 feet. It's getting up to its highest height. And you can watch as it comes around. Now we get its most speed right there at the bottom. And then it gives it the necessary speed to get through the top. You can see that uh, reason for the loop being a teardrop shape is called a clothoid loop. The clothoid loop. Clothoid loop. Uh, as it is, you can see the very top is a tighter, smaller radius. Yeah. And, the, and the curves coming into it are bigger radiuses. Huh. The reason for that is we can take our speed and we can take the radius using math again, now we figure out the g-force. What we want to do is, with the faster speeds, you want a bigger radius to keep your g-force lower. As the speed gets slower, now we can make our radius tighter, and we keep the g-force almost constant through that loop. And the answer to the mathematical question is 100 copies. 100 copies. Because you see, it's not an option to like cut one of the fishes in half. Because that would be dangerous. And then we have to call like the people for the ethical treatment of guppies or fish, which would be paid for a good pool for it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. All musical instruments and practically everything in nature has its own resonant frequency. And my wrench, this uh, two and three quarters wrench happens to be a B flat. 
but it also has all of the overtones, B flat, D, and F, and I can even isolate these overtones as we go. Hello again, all you fleshy water sacks, glob glob. Oh yes, he's Larry, the omnipotent head in a jar. Ba -da -da. <laughs> yeah, we get the message, we heard you the first time. Now, as you've heard, mathematics is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Yes, everywhere. Shut up, I will. And you can't get much more mathematical than musical. <laughs> Which brings me to Euclid. No, he wasn't one of the cousins on the Dukes of Hazard. He was a different character altogether. And I sat on one of his shells from about 323 to 283 BC. He's the guy who wrote the elements of Euclid. Clever title, Euclid. Which is why it's one of the most translated, published, and studied books in the Western world. Yeehaw! Got me in the kitchen there, partner. He wasn't a mathematician so much as a teacher of geometry. He also wrote books on optics and the elements of music, which in the third century, despite popular opinion, did not include Hansen. Honestly, you gotta believe this cat's been in his jaw way too long. You play this glass right here. Get your fingers good and let go around the rim. There's people in danger in this very neighborhood from the conspiracy of the house numbers and people's ages. <laughs> I'm incognito to see if I can sneak on them without their bearing. There they are! Kids, you must abort mission! Clear out of the area! Those bubbles aren't from a sauna! Who made the bubbles? Ever! Well, I know that! I don't want you to have problems! So if you want to be free from problems, get out of the war. World War II is over, man. Well, that answers a great deal. <laughs> now, bump that.